Starting off at number 10 now, we have the little blue one. This is a story of Castillo di Montebello. On June 1st, 1375, the five year old daughter of Lord Ugali, Nuccio da Montebello, was playing inside the house. Her name was Gwendolania. She was an albino who wasn't allowed out in the sun in case it damaged her skin. Her blue hair and blue eyes made everyone call her the little blue one. Now, on this day, her father went upstairs to check on her and asked where the little girl was, but she was nowhere to be found. She had run after her cloth ball into the sprawling dark dungeon, never to be found again. Now locals believe her ghost still roams the castle and that on summer solstice every five years, the little blue one calls out into the night. Next up at number 9 now, we have Pierre Zanfretta. From 1978 to 1981, this Italian security guard was the victim of not one, not two, three or four, but five separate alien abduction cases that took place in Genoa. After each time, he was regressed hypnotically and even voluntarily took truth serum in order to give a detailed and true account of the events. The abductions would always involve a group of aliens known as the Dragos, who were from the planet Zetonia. The first time, Zanfrita claimed to have seen four lights moving around in the garden of the house that he was commissioned to guard at that time. Suddenly, the engine, radio and lights of his vehicle all went out at the same time. He then saw four lights moving around the garden and presumed it was thieves come to rob the property. He crept through the gate and just as he was about to confront the trespassers, he felt something touch his shoulder. He spun around quickly and, in his own words, he described what he saw as an enormous, green, ugly and frightful creature with undulating skin, as though he were very fat or dressed in a loose grey tunic, no less than 10 feet tall. In later interviews, he would also describe the creatures as hairy, with points on the side of their faces, round fingertips and monstrous yellow triangular eyes. As I said in the beginning, this encounter was not the last one that he had. It would go on to become the stuff of legend in Italy and for the paranormal community worldwide. Next up at number 8 now, we have the Mouth of Truth. In the Paleo-Christian Church of Santa Maria in Rome lies a statue called the Mouth of Truth. It was built by the Romans during the Classical period and represents a river god with an open mouth, wide eyes and a flowing mane of hair. Legend says that if a liar puts their hand in that statue's mouth and says a lie, they will lose their hand. Just get bitten right off. The story goes that a rich wife of a Roman noble was accused of adultery. She denied the accusations, but her husband wanted to put her to the test, so he told her to put her hand inside the statue's mouth and say it. The wife had thought ahead of time though. She knew this was going to happen, and so, in front of the crowd at the statue, the man who was her secret lover embraced and kissed her. She then pretended that she didn't know him, accused him of being a madman, and the crowd chased him away. When she put her hand into the mouth, she declared that she had never kissed anyone except her husband and that madman who had just kissed her. Her hand was saved, but those who still suspected her believed that the hand must have lost its power. Many people still believe in its powers though, risking their entire hands to see if the legend still remains. Next up at number 7 now, we have The Crushing. The Sedele anime is a house in Genoa that has been linked to a number of disappearances over the years. Some say that many years ago it served as an inn for travellers on the road between Lombardy and Piedmont. According to the story, the innkeeper there would always warmly greet travellers. He would give them hearty drinks and then, when tiredness overcame them, he would suggest that they sleep in a particularly secluded room in the inn. Once the travellers would fall asleep, the ceiling would slowly begin to descend. By the time they woke up, they were being crushed against the ceiling. Once the travellers were dead, the innkeeper would dispose of their remains and gather whatever belongings they had to sell. For many years, these evil claims were dismissed, but they re-emerged when a bag of bones dating back to the 19th century were found near the house. Despite the creepy past, the house is still inhabited today, with supernatural occurrences happening on a regular basis. Next up at number 6 now, we have the Monastero Santa Radegonda. This old monastery in Milan sticks in the mind of anyone who visits it. It's a place that's not only known for its ghostly sightings, but also its ghostly sounds. Specifically, screams of torment. The story goes that in the late 14th century, Bernarda, daughter of Barnabo Visconti, was locked in the Rochetta di Porta Nuova. How am I doing with the pronunciations, by the way, in this video? I feel bad for my editor. You guys don't have to see how many attempts this is taking me. I scripted that because I know it's true. Anyway, Bernarda, the daughter, was locked away because she was accused of adultery, a claim which even her father believed. Her confinement took its toll on her and she began to fade away, dying just a few months after being locked up. Now, 
now they say her spirit roams the haunted church nearby. Many say they have seen her. Some even say they hear her anguished screams in the night, echoes of the pain she felt in the last pitiful months of her life. Moving on to number 5 now, we have the beautiful woman. There's an old legend surrounding the Villa di Corleano near Pisa. You may recognise the name Pisa from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. If you ever intend on going there, perhaps stop by this place before you leave. According to the legend, the house is home to the ghost of Teresa della Celta Bocca Gettini. In life, she was a beautiful woman from an ancient Pisan family. She was married to Count Cosimo Baldassari Agostini in 1755. They say that something bound her spirit not just to this mortal plane, but to the very house itself. Those familiar with the house have reported seeing her move noble tapestries and ornaments or slamming doors and windows. On nights with a full moon, the lady has been known to appear on the avenue of the grounds driving a spectral horse-drawn cart. The current owners say that although she's been sighted outside of the house, that doesn't mean any peace for them, as they themselves claim to have heard her laughing in the cellar. Next up at number 4 now, we have Devil's Monk Monastery. This monastery can be found in Salerno. Edmund says that a desperate wanderer once stopped by the entrance of the monastery asking for help one day. The monks did so, and the wanderer wanted to help repay them by working for them. He stayed with them for a long time, and decided to become a monk himself. He was happy for a while, but eventually he fell in love with a local woman. The other monks claimed that she was a witch, and warned him that she was a temptation sent by the devil. They tortured her to try and extract a confession. She never did though, and eventually died. Due to the loss of his love, the wanderer lost his mind, and vowed to take revenge on the monks and the locals. People started disappearing around the town. One day, a couple arrived at the monastery asking for help, just like the wanderer did all those years ago. The woman was never seen again, and the man was found dead with a broken skull. The wanderer was the one who welcomed them in. When the king learned what was happening, he sent soldiers to capture the madman. They hanged the demonic monk, and locals say his evil presence can still be felt in a monastery today. Coming at number 3 now, we have the mummies of Ferentilo. Below the church of Santo Stefano in Ferentilo lie buried bodies that have been preserved for a long time. Normally when I talk about preserved bodies in a video like this, it's due to humans using an embalming technique, usually for religious reasons. These bodies though were preserved by a rare microfungus that attacked corpses and turned them into mummies. Some of the mummies still have beards, teeth and hair. Among the dead are elderly people, a Napoleonic soldier, a murder victim, a mother with her child, and even two Chinese lover pilgrims who died during their travels around Italy. Despite the preservation being explained by natural causes, some say this place is very much unnatural, and that the preservation is a sign of an aura that exists below the church, one which people like to avoid, especially if they hear whispers down there at night. Moving on to number 2 now, we have Ospedale Monte Catone. This hospital was designed by famous fascist Mussolini in 1930. It was initially a hospital that specialised in the treatment of tuberculosis. Try as they might, they couldn't save everyone. Locals began to believe that the old hospital was filling up with the spirits of those who had died there. As the hospital aged and its capabilities waned, a wing of the hospital was abandoned out of necessity. Naturally, this place has now become a hot spot for paranormal investigators from all over the world. Some ghost hunting teams have already explored the remains of the hospital and claim to have seen a little girl running down the hallways. They say this is one of the tuberculosis victims that we talked about earlier. Along with the sightings, the hospital has also been talked about in conversations about why it hasn't been renovated yet. Some people believe the authorities know more about its aura than they are letting on. And finally, number one now, we have Villa Clara. This villa in Ferrara is often held up as perhaps the creepiest and most haunted place in Italy. The first thing people notice when visiting is that because of its location and unique positioning, it's almost always shrouded in darkness and a natural fog, even on the brightest of days. This alone is enough to stop some locals from even walking past the house. But there's more. One story says that a girl called Clara was buried alive in the house by her own father. Nobody alive today knows the exact reason. Some say she was a clairvoyant and that her powers scared her father so much that he decided to end her life. Some people feel compelled to visit Villa Clara, knowing there is a small chance they will hear Clara herself crying out for help across the ages. Going off number 10 now, we have the house that kills. Along the Venice canals, there are expensive houses that are snapped up whenever they go on the market, all except for one. Its name is Cadario, sometimes called the house that kills. It was built in the late 15th century for Giovanni Dario, secretary of the Venetian Republic Senate. When he died, the house was inherited by his daughter and her husband. After a while, the husband lost all 
of his possessions and was stabbed to death, while the daughter killed herself by drowning in the canal. They had a little boy who ended up being killed by assassins. The Venetians were shocked by the three violent deaths and started to think the house was cursed as it was built on an ancient cemetery. Others said it might be the inscription on the floor which read Giovanni Dario in honour of the city genius. In Italian that's actually an anagram of who will live in this house will be ruined. In the 19th century a descendant of the family sold it to a rich diamond merchant who quickly lost all of his wealth and died shortly after. The next owner died mysteriously in the house with his lover, perhaps in a murder suicide case. Death seemed to follow every owner thereafter. There was a suicide, then a car crash, then a murder, another suicide, another car crash, and then a suicide again, and then a heart attack. After all of that, it's no surprise that locals are now convinced that the Casa Dario is a cursed house. Even those who don't believe in curses have stayed well clear of the house that kills. Here's a little modern one for you guys now at number 9 with water blades. A number of years ago in northern Italy, a panic began to spread about a man known only as water blades. He was said to be an evil genius psychopath who would visit water parks attended by children. When nobody was looking, he would install blades in the water slides on the park. On some of them, he would leave tiny small blades that would just cut the people who rode them. But that was just a test. He would then build up to bigger and bigger blades, putting them in places to cause maximum damage to the riders. Legend says that people were left horribly disfigured for life after slashing themselves on these rides. According to the story, the knives were always found, but never water blades himself. Some people are glad that this is now a thing of the past, but for others, the damage is already done. People have been scarred for life, and now everyone kind of lives in fear of when water blades will return to leave a knife on a whole new ride for people who never saw it coming. Moving on to number 8 now, we have the Casa del Anime. This house in Voltri, Genoa, has a reputation as one of the most haunted houses in Italy. Many years ago, it was run as an inn by a family who all suffered from severe mental disorders. Legend says they would invite passing guests to stay for the night, sometimes even for free. This was all just a tactic though, to get them inside. Once they were asleep in their beds, the family would murder them, take their money and then throw their bodies into a mass grave. They say the souls of the victim are now bound to the house and roam around it during the night, making unearthly noises. For many years after this family's time there, the house lied empty. No doubt the stories had something to do with it. A new family finally moved in after the Second World War, and they witnessed a very creepy event. They said they always saw a young girl walking around the house dressed all in white, asking if anyone had seen her love. Locals believe the girl was engaged to one of the victims, and after he never returned to her, she went to look for him. Now she is doomed to wander around that house, looking for her lost love forever. Moving on to number 7 now, we have the Museum of Purgatory in Rome. In a small church in Rome lies a single room known as the Museum of Souls. For those of you who don't know, Catholics believe purgatory is the place between heaven and hell, where souls are trapped before they can advance to heaven. The chapel is known as a place where people will go and pray for their loved ones to advance to a happy afterlife. However, things have got creepy over the years, with recorded instances of trapped souls souls who have appeared to visitors and personally asked them for help. At first it was just eyewitness accounts, but then physical things started happening. There have been photos showing apparitions behind, and perhaps most creepy of all, handprints burned onto the pages of prayer books. If you were trying to get to heaven and avoid hell, perhaps you'd make yourself known just as much. At number 6 now guys, we have the Witches of Monte Matana. We're heading to Tuscany for this story, and it may either repel or attract you, depending on what kind of person you are. This is a mountain in the Italian Alps which offers hiking by day and witch hunting by night. For centuries, local legends say the area was a retreat for witches to perform their human sacrifices and occult rituals. They say the only reason anyone even knew that they were there was because shepherds would sometimes see flames and bright streaks of fire upon the mountainside. Today you can see a strange shaped rock that they are thought to have used as a table. Not in the table sense that you or I know more of a sacrificial table. Why did the witches return to this location? Well, again, local legend says they hid all of their wealth and treasure there before moving on to another life. Now, people go searching for the witches treasure. However, there is a problem for any witch slash treasure hunters out there. It's guarded by something, apparently. A ghostly spectre holding a huge scythe, exactly like the Grim Reaper. If you find the treasure and manage to avoid getting scythed by a witch's ghost, 
I guess it's all yours. Moving on to number 5 now we have Poveglia Island. Just off the coast of Venice you can find Poveglia Island, a place that many locals will never go near. Back in 1348 it was used as a quarantine colony for people who were caught the plague, known as the Black Death. People were sent there to die, with no hopes of being cured. Some believe that so many people were burned and buried there that the soil on the island is now made up of about 50% human ashes. By the 1800s the island was being used as a mental asylum, where people were locked up, rarely helped and often died in anguish. They say that the psychiatrist who ran the mental hospital was a butcher and torturer who tormented the patients for many years. Eventually he went mad from all the guilt and threw himself from the islands bell tower. He survived the fall but his body lay broken on the rocks. That's when witnesses say he was strangled to death by a ghostly mist that emerged from the ground. Some say this was the island itself, now intertwined with the dark energy of death and taking its revenge. It's no surprise that boats stay clear of Poveglia Island and visitors are few and far between. Moving on to number 4 now we have Brolio Castle. In Brolio there is a castle that has belonged to the Riccasoli family since 1141. It was owned by Bettino Riccasoli until 1880 when he died of a heart attack in the castle. His body was not buried right away though, but kept near the altar of the crypt in the family chapel. During that time rumours began to circulate about strange apparitions around the castle. People caught glimpses of spirits walking about the castle as if they were still alive. None of this had happened before Bettino had died. The wind began to blow harder than it ever did for that time of year, opening and slamming windows violently. A swarm of moss invaded the chapel, forcing many of the mourners to flee. However, this was all building up to one single moment. When they tried to lift the coffin up again, it was too heavy. More people came, and more, but it just wouldn't budge an inch. It was like the whole thing was full of rocks. Suspecting demonic forces at hand, they fetched the local priest. He arrived and placed his hand on the coffin, muttering words in Latin for a while. When he had finished, to everyone's amazement, the coffin was suddenly light again. The priest claimed that all of the damned souls in the area had seen the coffin as a safe place to hide and had come from miles around to do so. He had dispelled them from the coffin, but unleashed them on Brolio Castle. In the years since then, the souls are said to still wander the grounds there, ready to torment any visitors who disturb them. Next up at number 3 now, we have the Capuchin Catacombs. In this place lie the skeletons or preserved bodies of as many as 8 thousand people, hanging from the walls or in glass caskets for the world to see. It was started by monks who would preserve their own so that they could pray with them, not just for them. Then locals began to pay the monks for their family members to also be interned in the catacombs so that they too could visit and pray with them. Monks, priests, teachers, professionals, men, women and children are all placed in different categories, hung up on niches or shelves. The Capuchin catacombs stopped taking bodies in 1920. One of the final interments was that of two Two year old Rosalia Lombardo. She died of pneumonia. An embalmer used a secret technique to preserve her body over the past 100 years. Visitors are amazed to see just how lifelike she looks after all this time. Sometimes, though, she is said to have actually opened her eyes. Scientists say this is just a trick of the light, but those who have seen it would argue otherwise. They believe that the energy of the catacombs have a dark power over the bodies that lie there. For a price, you can actually spend the night locked in the catacombs. I don't know what kind of person would want to do that though, and I don't know what they would do if one of the bodies slowly opened their eyes. Next up at number 2 now we have Villa Magnoni. This is an ominous looking house located in the otherwise picturesque Italian countryside near the city of Kona. These days the house is almost entirely boarded up, which has led many people to believe the whole place is haunted. One of the only stories that has survived over the years comes from the 1980s. Back then a group of friends reportedly visited the house and heard children singing in the garden. Great, they thought. I guess the place isn't haunted after all. When they went round to the garden though, the laughing stopped as soon as they turned the corner. There was nobody there. Then they looked up to the house and scanned the windows. They were all either empty or boarded up, except for one of them at the very top. In that window they saw a woman. She was wearing all white, her eyes wide open, and she was screaming at them. She screamed so loud they could actually hear what she was saying. She was telling them to leave. Leave now. The friends ran in fear and then sped away in their car. They actually crashed on the way home, killing three out of four of them. Months later, the survivor returned to the house to investigate. He searched inside the house and went up to the window where they saw the woman originally. He froze on the spot. The room from which she appeared had no floor. And finally at number 1 now we have the ghost of Palazzo Vecchio. In the old city of Florence lies this luxury villa. There once lived a man there
there called Baldaccio. He was a medieval nobleman and brave warrior who was ultimately betrayed, wrongly accused of treason and killed inside the palace in 1441. He was stabbed and thrown out of a window, probably on the orders of a rival nobleman. Now his spirit remains in the palace, filled with rage at the people who killed him. In the century since then, locals have learnt that there's a set of rules to not anger the ghost of Baldaccio. After dark, you should not scream his name, you should not name him without a reason, and you must always speak with respect in a low, hushed tone. The most famous sighting of Baldaccio happened in 2001 when he appeared in the background of a wedding picture taken. Experts said the photo had not been tampered with, only adding to the legend of the angry ghost. Starting off this countdown, we have the ghostly hand. Costanza Conti de Cupis was a very beautiful woman in the 17th century. She was often praised because she had beautiful hands. In fact, an artist even cast a mold of her hands, which he then displayed in his workshop. But that's not the creepy part. Apparently one day a stranger warned her that she was going to lose her hand very soon. Well, shortly after she was sewing and she pricked her finger with a needle. This tiny prick turned into an infection which spread to her arm. As a result, she needed to have her whole arm amputated. Sadly, she eventually died of this infection. Now it's said that her presence lurks the streets of Rome. In fact, there have been numerous reported sightings of her apparition. Others say that that when the moon shines on a window near Palazzo de Cupis, you'll be able to see her hand pressing against the glass window. Moving on to number nine, we have Beatrice Chenje. The ghost of Beatrice Chenje is probably the most well-known legend and famous ghost story in Rome. So story goes that Beatrice had a very hot-headed and controlling father. Eventually, her and her family grew sick of his behavior and attitude, so they killed him. But police noticed his absence and eventually found his dead body. As a result, Beatrice and her family were sentenced to death. Now it's said that Beatrice's ghost appears every year on the night of her death, walking along the bridge that leads to the Castel Sant'Angelo. Some have even reported seeing her carrying her own head in her arms. In our eighth spot, we have Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a great and well-known emperor of the Roman Empire. He was killed on the Ides of March in 44 BCE. Now, his ashes were placed inside of a lead ball. In 1585, the Pope at the time opened it up to see if his ashes were really in there. Well, legend goes that when he did this, it released the ghost of Julius Caesar. Because now, his ghost roams the city. <laughs> Get it? Roams the city? Sorry, that was lame. In fact, tons of people have seen his apparition near the Colosseum. Moving on at number seven, we have the Mouth of Truth. Near the foot of the Aventine Hills, there is a Roman statue that has been a very popular tourist attraction for years. The structure is an ancient stone mask, supposedly representing a Roman god. The mask has wide eyes and an open mouth. Now, legend goes that if a liar puts their hand inside the god's mouth, they will lose it. This legend dates all the way back to Roman times, when a wife of a Roman noble was accused of adultery. To prove her innocence, her husband wanted her to put her hand inside the stone mouth. If she was lying, she would lose her hand. Well, this little sneaky woman devised a plan with her secret lover. On that day, her lover kissed her by the statue in front of her husband. The woman then acted appalled and was like, ah, it's a madman, and the crowd chased him away. She then stated that she's never kissed anyone else besides her husband and this madman, which technically wasn't a lie since her lover was the madman. So she put her hand in the mouth of truth and she didn't lose her hand and was found not guilty. Pretty clever woman. Coming in at number six, we have the executioner. Mastro Tita was Rome's official executioner. He was responsible for putting more than 500 people to death. Now it's said that his restless spirit wanders around near the Castel Sant'Angelo. Apparently, in the early morning, you can see him in his red uniform wandering around. Now, others say that if you see him, he may offer you tobacco, but you must reject it because Mastro would offer tobacco to the people sentenced to death 
just before he would decapitate them. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the seventh door to hell. Back in medieval times, it was thought that the famous Colosseum in Rome was one of the seven doors to hell. In fact, it said that after each gladiator fight, a man would dress up as the ferryman to the underworld. Basically, the ferryman for Hades that carries souls of the deceased to the world of the dead. Well, apparently, he would use a hot iron to test if the victim was truly dead. Then he would carry them through one of the doors in the Colosseum. That's how this legend came to life. Now, others say that the Colosseum is infested with ghosts of individuals who died during the fights. Every now and then, you can hear sounds of heavy chains being dragged on the ground. And some have even saw ghosts walking around in the cellars. Moving on to number four, we have the Temple of Beelzebub. Now, this is another urban legend surrounding the Colosseum. This time, it was thought that the Colosseum was dedicated to Beelzebub, the prince of all demons. According to the legend, in order to become members of his following, you would have to go into the Colosseum and answer the following question. Do you adore Beelzebub? In fact, it is even thought that the name Colosseum was derived from this phrase. Coming in at number three, we have the flaming carriage. Well, Rome is apparently filled with ghosts. This time, let's talk about the ghost of Olympia Marikina. When Olympia was 20 years old, she was married for the first time. But that marriage didn't last long because her husband died and she became very rich. Now, Olympia was very, very power hungry and eventually became the Pope's right-hand woman. Now, legend goes that just before the Pope died, she took two big cases of gold, stuffed it into her carriage, and fled. Now, people have reported seeing her dressed in all black, fleeing Piazza Navona while carrying her stolen gold. Others claim to have heard her shrieking in laughter while you can see her in a ghostly black carriage. In our second spot, we have the Souls in Purgatory. So there's a museum in Rome called the Museum of Souls in Purgatory. Basically, it is filled with creepy objects that are apparently signed by souls trapped in purgatory. The artifacts include Bibles with handprints burned in, tabletops with fingerprints on it, and clothing with imprints on their sleeves. Some say that this is also from souls trying to communicate with their living relatives. Either way, this museum sounds pretty cool and I would love to go there and check out all those artifacts. Who's with me? And in our number one spot, we have the Capuchin Crypt, another supposedly haunted area in Rome. And honestly, I can see why this one is haunted. This crypt contains six different chambers and thousands of human bones. In fact, five of the chambers are elaborately decorated with the bones of dead people. There are chandeliers made of the bones and wall decor. In fact, there's a crypt of skulls, crypt of pelvises, crypt of leg bones, and thigh bones. So. I could see why this place is haunted. Like they separated body parts from each other and then made it into decor pieces. So people have reported seeing shadowy figures, orbs have been caught in photos, and there have even been extreme hot and cold spots. On top of that, candles and torches have gone out entirely or would be caught flickering. Same thing happened when electricity was installed. Bulbs would flicker or would be blown out entirely. Pretty creepy.